Erwin Kotler is a really old pal of mine. We go back a long time, all the way to McGill and even before that. We used to pal around at the McGill Daily and at the Debating Society. We used to spend long nights in the Students' Union debating dialectic. Uh, he went on to become a professor of law, a highly successful politician, and Minister of Justice in the Paul Martin government, and I drifted into television. <laughs> I have an anecdote about you. I'm wondering if this is the moment. <laughs> OK. So I get a phone call one day, and it's Irwin. And he says, Moses, the party has decided we can't do both. Same-sex marriage or legalized marijuana? <laughs> so without hesitation, I said, legalized marijuana. And Irwin says to me, why? And I said, well, because the number of people involved is so much greater on the side of marijuana. And, and, and really, the penalties of being on the wrong side of the law are so much more severe. So he listened carefully. and wrote the law to legalize same-sex marriage. <laughs> yeah. Can I use a podium? Do you want one? You don't need one. All right, OK. okay. <laughs> Actually, there was a second part. Did table the legislation for same-sex marriage and supported the legalization of marijuana at the time, which only later came to pass. <clears throat> Although I have to say, my, my son, who has a wicked uh, sense of humor, on the day that I uh, tabled the same-sex marriage, it happened uh, to coincide with my ordering the extradition of one of the mafia leaders, uh, Rizzuto, to the United States. Uh, whereupon my son called me up that day and he said, Dad, face it, on the same-sex marriage, half the people love you and the other half hate you. Now, with regard to Rizzuto, you just need one of them to hate you enough and it's all over. <laughs> there are a few other th exchanges where Moses, if time permitted, I'd love to share, but I, I, I want to begin uh, by saying <clears throat> that I want to commend, uh, as we are coming together on the 20th anniversary of Idea City, and I want to commend Moses Namer for his inspired leadership all these years, of which we are all his beneficiaries. <clears throat> as it happens, we meet at an important moment of remembrance and reminder. We meet on the 25th anniversary of the genocide of the Tutsis in Rwanda, where 25 years ago, 10,000 Tutsis were murdered every day for three months. But what makes the genocide of the Tutsis so unspeakable is not only the horror of the genocide itself. That is bad enough. What makes it so unspeakable is that this genocide was preventable. Nobody could say we did not know. We knew, but we did not act. Just as in Darfur, we knew, but we did not act. In Syria, we knew, and we did not act. And with regard to the Rohingya, we knew, we know, and we are still not acting as the culture of impunity reigns with respect to those who perpetrated what the Canadian Parliament, to its credit, called the genocide of the Rohingyas. We meet also on another important moment of remembrance and reminder. It's the 75th anniversary of the mass deportation between 
mid-May and the beginning of July 1944, of the mass deportation of 440,000 Hungarian Jews to the death camps in Auschwitz, while the international bystander community, who could not say at that time that they did not know, acquiesced in what was happening. In July 1944, a Swedish diplomat, Raoul Wallenberg, became Canada's first honorary citizen, came to the Swedish legation in Budapest. And for the next six months, through his bravado and bluff, through the mobilization of others, they saved the remnant of 100,000 Hungarian Jews. So what the whole international bystander community could not bring itself to do, one man demonstrated that one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act can confront evil and transform history. And that remains as an inspirational role model for young people today. And that is why we established three years ago when I left Parliament a Rao Wallenberg Center for Human Rights to show how one person acting with integrity can make a difference. And as it happens, we meet at an important, I would say, historical inflection moment today, where we are witnessing a resurgent global authoritarianism, a massive assault on human rights, the retreat of democracies, and the pain and plight of political prisoners as a looking glass into this historical inflection moment. And so what I would like to do is share with you four case studies of this resurgent authoritarianism and of the political prisoners whose lens is a looking glass into both the cultures of corruption and criminality and the impunity that continues to underpin them. The four case studies are Saudi Arabia, its criminalization of dissent, case study of the imprisoned blogger Raif Badawi. Iran, I'd like to put it, Khamenei's Iran, because I'd like to distinguish it from the people and publics in Iran who are otherwise the targets of mass domestic depression themselves. And we'll look here at the case studies of the imprisoned environmentalists in Iran and a heroic human rights lawyer, Nasreen Sutada, has come to be known as the Mandela of Iran. The third case study will be that of Maduro's Venezuela. And here we'll look at Leopoldo's trumped up charges and imprisonment. And finally, and reference has been made to it in the previous speakers, so this will be another interesting uh, looking glass, and that is China looking at uh, the case of Wang Bizang. I might add parenthetically that I happen to be acting as international legal counsel for each of these political prisoners, and our Raoul Wallenberg Center has taken up their case and cause, so I'll be sharing uh, with you our own involvement in these cases, and there is a clear, as you will see as it unfolds, a clear Canadian nexus to each and all of these case studies. So let me begin with the case of Saudi Arabia. As we meet the imprisoned Saudi blogger Raif Badawi, and we just marked the seventh anniversary of his arrest, has been languishing in prison for seven years for saying 
seven years ago what Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, in his charm offensive last year in visiting the United States and Europe, was himself saying, namely, that we need a more open Saudi Arabia, a more moderate Islam. Equally, Raif Badawi's sister, Samar Badawi, has been languishing in prison for calling for the right to drive even after the crown prince has instituted the right to drive and where other women human rights defenders are equally languishing in prison as we meet. Now, as it happened a little less than a year ago, our foreign minister, Christia Freeland, tweeted a call for the release of both Raif Badawi and his sister, Samar Badawi. This was nothing new. Canada had tweeted a call for the release of Raif Badawi under the uh, previous Conservative government. The Canadian Parliament had unanimously adopted resolutions calling for Raif Badawi's release and the like. Yet the Saudi Kingdom, you recall, erupted in fury. They ejected the Canadian ambassador to Saudi Arabia. They recalled the Saudi ambassador from Canada. They suspended all trade and investment with uh, Canada. They recalled 15,000 Saudi students studying in Canada, including senior fellows. In fact, a self-defeating measure, as these students were gaining an education here that can only benefit Saudi Arabia on uh, their return. But the reason I'm sharing all this with you is after this ferocious outburst of Saudi Arabia in the manner that I just described, not one democracy came to Canada's defense. Not one. NGOs did. Media wrote about it. Civil society spoke up. But not one of the community of democracies came to Canada's defense. The silence of the democracies, as I wrote at the time, emboldened the crown prince and led him to believe that he could, in effect, behave with impunity. And that took us down the road two months later to the brutal murder of Jamal Khashoggi. There's almost a direct line between the silence of the democracies and then the brutal murder of Khashoggi. That murder served for a while as a wake-up call. There were resolutions of condemnation in the European Parliament and in Congress and the like. But as we meet, the criminalization of dissent continues the impunity has intensified. More have been arrested and imprisoned in Saudi Arabia. And as the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Executions, Agnes Calamard, reported just yesterday in her report, she found that the murder of Jamal Khashoggi was, as she put it, a deliberate premeditated extrajudicial execution accompanied by torture with credible evidence that the crown prince had to know about what happened and recommending, as she did, an independent international investigative commission of inquiry and the sanctioning of leading Saudi officials, including the Crown Prince, until that investigation is satisfactorily concluded. The response by the Saudi authorities was immediate. They rejected any notion of an investigation. They will not permit any investigative officials to enter Saudi Arabia, just as they didn't allow the UN Special a rapporteur 
uh, to do so. And as I said, the criminality and the impunity continue. Which brings me to the second case study, and that of Khamenei's Iran. On December 10th, Human Rights Day, our Rao Wallenberg Center for Human Rights released a report documenting and detailing the massive assaults, arrests, imprisonment, tortures, in detention, extrajudicial execution of an almost unprecedented character in the year 2018, where many of the leaders of every civil society group in Iran were subjected to arrest and imprisonment and sometimes torture. I'm speaking about the women's movement, which has emerged as the largest and most courageous human rights movement uh, in Iran today. I'm speaking about uh, journalists, about ethnic and religious leaders, about students, about trade union leaders, as I say, leaders of all expressions of civil society. And in a Kafkaesque move that would make even Kafka blush, environmentalists and environmental protection in Iran became a capital offense. And so while Iran, with the environmental degradation that it is suffering, desperately needs the assistance and the protection of their own environmentalists, of the Persian Wildlife Heritage Fund that was founded by an Iranian Canadian, they subjected the eight members of that environmental protection group to arrest, imprisonment, some tortured in detention, and imposed national security charges against them, rendering them liable themselves for execution. Reminding us of the old Stalinist approach of give us the persons and we will find the crime. And so environmental protection has been made a capital offense. And which brings me to the case of this brave, heroic woman, Nasreen Sutada, where we just recently marked the anniversary of her arrest. And where some three months ago, Nasreen Sutada, who has gone down the line to defend other women, to defend juveniles destined for execution, to defend journalists, to defend other human rights defenders, to defend other political prisoners, until she herself became a political prisoner. And some close to three months ago, a woman in her mid-50s, this heroic woman was sentenced to 38 years in prison and 148 lashes, a virtual death sentence for the woman who has emerged, as I said, as the Mandela of Iran. Our report also documented the 19 major architects of repression in Iran, those responsible for these waves of arrest and imprisonment and torture and detention, which include amongst them the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Intelligence, the Chief Justice, and the like. But as we meet, not one of the 19 has yet been sanctioned. And that is why I was pleased that just two days ago, our House Foreign Affairs Committee, before whom appeared four incredibly courageous Iranian women's rights leaders, former political prisoners, exiled dissidents, came to Canada, came to Parliament, came before uh, our Foreign Affairs Committee, met with leaders of our government, and as a result of their compelling, riveting testimony, 
I am pleased that the Foreign Affairs Committee has recommended the application of Magnitsky sanctions to sanction these architects of repression and to begin the process of combating the culture of impunity in Iran. Which leads me to the third case study, and that is that of Maduro's Venezuela. About close to two years ago, I was one of three people, other two were Latin Americans, a judge from Argentina, Santiago Canton, a judge from Costa Rica, Manuela Ventura Drobles, to be appointed to what the Organization of American States called in appointing us an independent panel of legal experts to look into whether there are reasonable grounds to believe that crimes against humanity are being committed in Venezuela. And so we held public hearings, examined all the intergovernmental, governmental reports, met with NGOs, et cetera, et cetera. And a year ago, at the conclusion of our sustained involvement, we held that there were indeed reasonable grounds to conclude that seven major crimes against humanity were being committed in Venezuela. And we named the crimes, and we named those are responsible, which included multiple cases of murder, 12,000 cases of arbitrary imprisonment and deprivation of liberty, horrific cases of torture that led Justice Manuel Ventura Drobles to say that in all of his years on the bench, 25 years, he had never seen such horrific cases of torture, of massive cases of sexual violence, of forced disappearances, of all this being committed under a persecutory crime against humanity, whereby all those believed to be opponents of the regime, or those even who do not speak up to support the regime, were themselves uh, targeted with respect to each or any of these above crimes against humanity. And the worst, the worst being state-orchestrated humanitarian suffering, the weaponization of food and medicine, which has led to hundreds of thousands of preventable deaths and diseases, diseases that have disappeared, that have come back with a vengeance, diphtheria, tuberculosis, malaria, and the like. And where all this has led these crimes against humanity, the state orchestrated humanitarian suffering, to an almost unprecedented exodus of four million Venezuelans who have left one million since last November. And indeed, since our report of a year ago, the situation has only worsened. The humanitarian suffering has gotten worse. The number of political prisoners has quadrupled. The assaults on the rule of law have intensified and one can go on. But I will conclude with a case study of Venezuela's authoritarianism and the massive assaults on human rights through the looking glass of Leopoldo Lopez, the leader of the democratic opposition, who was arrested in February 2014, recently <coughs> escaped but in the Spanish embassy. But let me just tell you his, the witness testimony very graphically as we heard it in our public hearings. We heard from Judge Renata Tovar, a judge from Venezuela who issued the arrest warrant for Leopoldo Lopez's arrest, who escaped, came to Washington, appeared in our public hearings, and said that she was ordered to issue the arrest warrant on pain of imprisonment 
and torture of herself. We heard from Franklin Nees, the special prosecutor in Leopoldo Lopez's case, who also escaped from Venezuela, who appeared before our public hearings and said that he had been ordered by the Maduro government to issue false and trumped up charges against Leopoldo Lopez. We heard from witnesses, also those who had escaped, who testified that they had been tortured into issuing false confessions against Leopoldo Lopez. And so I'm giving you just one looking glass into the assault on the rule of law, into the criminalization of dissent, into the culture of impunity. Our Commission of Inquiry recommended that Maduro and designated leaders whom we identified and their criminality whom we documented, that this be referred to the International Criminal Court for investigation and possible prosecution. I'm delighted to say that Canada led the way, along with uh, a number of Latin American countries joined by France and Germany, to make the first ever collective referral to the International Criminal Court, the first in the history of the International Criminal Court, and to refer those suspected of crimes against humanity to the International Criminal Court for investigation and prosecution. Regrettably, to this date, the ICC has not yet moved on this recommendations. And, as I mentioned, and this is the most important thing, the humanitarian suffering in Venezuela continues to worsen amidst the assault on human rights, the crimes against humanity, the culture of impunity. And so this too must be yet another challenge to combat the resurgent authoritarianism in Venezuela, which I might add is being aided and abetted by other resurgent authoritarians who are propping up the Maduro regime, namely Russia and China and Iran. Which brings me to the final case, and that is that of uh, China and the case study of Dr. Wang Bizang as a looking glass into this resurgent global authoritarianism in China in all its manifestations. This particular story doesn't begin on December 1st, but December 1st provides the frame, uh, the trigger, to describe what is now happening, and it dovetails with some of what uh, was said earlier in other contexts. On December 1st, <clears throat> Canadian Department of Justice, acting pursuant to a request from the United States under the Canada-US extradition treaty, arrested Mei Guanzhou, the chief operating officer of Huawei Corporation, on grounds that she had committed fraud and breach of Iran sanctions and the like. This is essentially almost a straight professional operation. I can tell you, as Moses mentioned, that I was former Minister of Justice and Attorney General, but I can tell you that with regard to matters of extradition, the initial stage is a professional Department of Justice to Department of Justice representation and pursuant to a bilateral extradition treaty between Canada and, and the U.S., the Canadian uh, government would respond to that initial request if on the face of it, that uh, which the person <coughs> who is being arrested stands accused would also be a crime in Canada, we execute the arrest warrant. But in this case, Meng Wanzhou, after she was arrested, got the right to bail, the right to counsel, the right to live in her <coughs> home mansion, 
in Vancouver and the right to an extradition hearing before an independent judiciary where she will be able to challenge that extradition decision. But what happened shortly after that, after Canada acting pursuant to a rule of law request, were the Chinese authorities responding by calling what Canada did as vile, evil, and unconscionable, and then proceeding to engage in, in hostage diplomacy, of which you've been reading about arresting two Canadians uh, in China, holding them virtually incommunicado, denying them the right to counsel, charging them with national security charges, two other Canadians elevating their charges to risks of execution, trade embargo, I can go on and on. But I want to close with the case that you didn't hear much about, because that's a real looking glass into not the evil, unconscionable behavior of Canada, but I would say the manner in which China has been acting in an evil and unconscionable manner. And I'm not referring here to the internment and indoctrination, though I could, to the Uyghurs, or the prosecution and persecution of the Falun Gong, or what has been happening to the Tibetans. Those are also part of the indictment. But just through the looking glass of Dr. Wang Bizang's case and his daughter, Tiana Wang. Dr. Wang Bizang came to Canada in 1979, received his doctorate in medicine from McGill University, and then decided while practicing medicine would be a good thing to do, establishing an overseas China democracy movement to try to bring democracy to China was even more compelling. Fast forward to 2002. Dr. Wang Bizang is in Vietnam with some of his colleagues where he's abducted by the Chinese authorities, brought back to China, and in a sham trial of less than two hours is charged and convicted of both the crimes of treason and terrorism and sentenced to life imprisonment in solitary confinement, during which in the last 17 years he suffered a series of debilitating strokes. Which brings us to his daughter, Tiana Wang, named after Tiananmen Square, whose anniversary we've just commemorated, 30th anniversary. She recently graduated from McGill Law School, now working here in Toronto, has been trying desperately for 10 years to get a visa to visit her ailing father. She gives birth to her infant son and finally gets a visa, and the visit is to take place amidst all that now is happening between Canada and China around <coughs> the extradition cases and the like. She travels to China with her infant son. She stopped at the Beijing airport. She's not permitted to see her very ailing father. She's put on a plane to go back to Korea, to fly back to Canada. That plane has a stopover in Beijing. When it stops in Beijing, Chinese authorities mount the plane, seize her and her infant, put them in a cell in China, and only after an outcry was she released and allowed to return to Canada, but not able to see her father, nor have her father see his a grandson. That is tragically unconscionable. And I might say in that context, inhumane. Which brings me now to a close. Yes. <laughs> I, I only want to say one thing in closing that every one of us can make a difference. We don't have to be a Raoul Wallenberg. I'll close just by quoting once our sage Maimonides that had influence for Moses and myself. 
when he said that we should each see the world as divided into half evil and half good. Therefore, one good deed by any one of us on any given day can transmit the scale from evil to good. It may be saying a kind word to a friend who is in need of it or refraining from saying an unkind word. It may be in visiting the sick. It may be in mourning a deceased. It may be simply in taking one small step in whatever way we can to advance the case and cause of human rights and let these political prisoners know that they are not alone, that we stand in solidarity with them, and we will not relent until they are released. Thank you. Thank you so much.